Hey guys, welcome back to the OT Lifestyle Movement Podcast. I'm Rhiannon Crisp, occupational therapist, personal trainer, and founder of otlifestylemovement.com. Guys, I am so excited about today's conversation. Today, we are talking all about trauma and supporting the conscious evolution of the human spirit. Now, today is the kind of interview you're probably going to want to listen to a few times to really absorb the wisdom of our guest today. And I can say this with absolute certainty and confidence without even having started the interview yet, because today's guest is one of the most inspiring and knowledgeable OTs that I have come across in this space. Today, we are talking with Kim Barthel. Kim Barthel is a world-renowned occupational therapist with over 35 years experience working around the globe. She is an advanced neurodevelopmental treatment instructor and a teacher of sensory integration, trauma, and attachment theory. Kim is a bridge between the science of neurobiology, mental health, and everyday function and a proponent of putting your mind in the mind of the other. She is a mentor, an author, and just an absolute legend. Welcome, Kim. What does someone even say to an introduction like that? That was extremely humbling and hard to receive and listen to that. So Ah. thank you. It was all true and I'm so super pumped to have you on and I know so many of the other OTs who are tuning in will be so excited and um, grateful that you are here sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and your insights with us. So I can't wait to dive in but what we do first of all is we hit the rewind button because we love to learn a little bit about our guests. So if you can rewind the clock a little bit And tell us about your story and how you came to do all the amazing work that you're doing today. You know, even though you gave me a heads up about these questions, this is a tough one because it's a long answer. The idea of becoming an occupational therapist started when I was nine. Can you imagine, uh, I'm 57, so at the age of nine, all those years ago, occupational therapy wasn't even very well understood. But what I always loved was the idea of doing something unique. And even as a child, the uniqueness of this profession uh, and the vastness of this profession, which I was exposed to in a in a very unique way in and of itself as a girl guide volunteering in a system for children with special needs. And there was an occupational therapist in that institution who I thought was the coolest person. And I think I said one day, that's what I want to do. And it just never changed after that exposure to, uh, to our profession. It is an amazing profession, isn't it? And it is so unique. And I think that's why so many OTs Mm -hmm. come to love it because we do have this holistic lens on life and people and environment and function and participation. And you can do so many things with this profession. I feel like we are limited by by our imagination. And, you know, right away in university in my very first year, which was all about science, I was introduced to sensory integration in one of my professors was really excited about this topic. That was in 1980. And instantaneously, I fell in love with that topic. And so my entire focus, even as a student, was about understanding the mysteries of the brain and it just unfolded right from from there i love that and your mission is to support the conscious evolution of the human spirit i'd love for you to explain what this means 
-hmm. Well, along the way in my journey as an OT, there have been many, many mentors. Uh, Dr. Jean Ayres was my mentor, and Mrs. Bobath from Neurodevelopmental Treatment was my mentor. And when I think about my journey as an NDT instructor, there, there is one particular story that really was quite transformative for me that unfolded that idea of consciousness. Becoming a neurodevelopmental treatment instructor is not for the faint of heart. And there are not very many of us. And you don't get a lot of chances to mm, pass this process. And I had a, a, a demo that I had to do in my very ending of becoming an NDT instructor. And I chose this little boy uh, in front of my adjudicators, I'm gonna use that word, to be my demonstration of my skills to use this incredible therapeutic frame of reference. And this little guy was just two. And he had athetoid cerebral palsy, so his body was not very cooperative. And my, my intention was to improve his hand function. So I'm doing all my handling things that I do, that you're supposed to do. And I watched him get frustrated. And this was in, you know, 1987, 88, something around that era. And I said to him in the middle of my demo, it's okay. Look at all the great things that your hand can do. And my mentor, her name was Reggie Bain, very, very famous NDT instructor. She said to this boy, no, you have the right to be irritated and frustrated that your hand doesn't do what you want it to do. And this little two-year-old said, hate self, cut hand off, just die. And I remember in that moment feeling absolutely mortified that somebody that little could have that much awareness of their difference. I also had another thought at the same time, like there goes my NDT instructorship process because this was a complete derail of where I was going. So this little guy stood up on all his stiffness and started punching at the air. And he said to Reggie, you're a witch. And his mom cried and I cried. But Reggie did something very powerful that I talk about every day now. She held space. And that means she was present to his experience of changing emotions and didn't try to distract him, redirect him, or fix it. And this little guy went from despair to rage to starting to move his fingers independently in a matter of three, four minutes. And I watched him move his digits in a way that none of my NDT would have ever given me. So I turned to her and I said, I was 25, 26, I wanna know how to do that right now. And she smiled at me and she said, be careful what you ask for because that is not a course that you can take. That is you working on you. And I was like, sign me up, whatever that means. <laughs> and I didn't have any idea what it meant to deeply understand yourself as being the primary instrument of change for others at the time. So I, was it was like somebody took a switch and lit me up into this inquiry of, well, what am I bringing to this process of the work that we do? Because up until then, what I understood about what we do was all in my head. It was all theory, all cognitive, 
all knowledge, no wisdom. And this invited me into this realm of emotion. Well, I'm still on that same journey of the quest to become my best self. And so when we are willing and able and invested and conscious, we have tremendous possibility to continue to evolve. And so in keeping with Reggie's mission, you know, every interaction that I enter into, my intention is to raise the vibration of myself and to enter into a relationship with another person that helps us to continue to create a better planet that we live on. So that's what it means to me. Wow. And that really shaped the trajectory of your whole career, didn't it? Yes. In, in that one hour and where, and, and it, it, what it taught me to do was to say, yes, I'm uh, in this moment today in amongst all the workshops I've done today, writing a new one uh, on for parents on how to help our children become their best self. And it's about the yes brain versus the no brain. And as I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, love, I love neurobiology, have postgraduate work in neurobiology. And the yes brain is a receptive brain. It's a conscious brain. It's an evolving brain. And so when you step into uh, that in, invitation to say yes, you have no idea what you're going to create next. And that's one of the amazing things about this profession is you, we have no idea where it's going to take us. Mm, absolutely. And I'm sure so many OTs got so many takeaways out of that. And it leads me to my next question, which is one of your favorite sayings, or maybe it's your most favorite saying is the only person you can change is yourself. And that sounded like the theme that was running through that just mm. then. Um, I'd love for you to explore this with us because if this is the case, I'm sure OTs will be thinking, okay, well, if the only person I can change is myself and I'm getting referrals to see clients to help change them and support them, how mm. does this work? How can I become the best version of myself to support I, my clients? I am so glad that you asked that question because, well, you know, many of us in our education uh, took the course therapeutic use of self. It's a big part of what we do. And I loved that idea way back when of this fluffy thought that what I do with me has some impact on someone else. But now we have the science of interpersonal neurobiology, which is what happens in our biology, our brain, our immune system, our hormones, our energy fields, I'm gonna say it out loud, between us when we resonate or when we are in relationship. And so the more that I show up from a evolved place, the more and more open and willing that I am to see you as who you are underneath all of the behavior that you bring, you get to see that in yourself. I too fall into the dilemma of problem solving. I'm a great problem solver. And I mean, we were trained to do that, to task analyze. And we need that skill because that is one of our gifts as occupational therapists is to help people and support people, but we also want to help them find their best solutions. And that happens in that collaborative response. So I wanna respond one more thing to your question. That same kid that I described in my demo is now in his late 30s. 
and or mid thirties might not make it that bad. And he is uh, a lawyer. He is a lawyer with athetoid cerebral palsy. And I asked him, what did you learn in occupational therapy at my private clinic three times a week for 15 years? What do you remember about that over a dinner conversation? And this criminal lawyer said to me, hmm, you know that saying, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime? That's what I learned in therapy. And I was stunned. I was like, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you know how you taught me how to dress myself and walk down the hall and get in and out of bed? And he said, do you think I would waste any of my energy doing that now? I need all my energy for the courtroom. But I know how to advocate for myself because what you taught me was to believe in myself. And I think that so many of us, what we do is we, our clients may not remember, you know, the transfers, the activities that we give them to do, the analysis that we do. They remember how they feel when they're with you. And that is the lasting shift that neuroplastically changes their brain. So I feel that, you know, this is what we, that idea of becoming my best self, the only person that I can change is myself. I cannot make anyone do anything. But if I can understand them, motivate them, support them, empower them, connect with them, then they can own that skin, that skill for themselves. I love that, Kim. And that is so heartfelt and so empowering and inspiring as a story. I feel like as OTs, we can get caught up in the drive to provide results. And we're like, we get in, we have a therapy session and our clients are seeing us because they want to see results. So we become very results orientated and um, work through the tools and the strategies and the processes and the systems and the things that we need to tick off our to-do list rather than just being and being present and holding space like you were talking about. So I think that is so wonderful to open our eyes to that, that that is actually okay. And it's part of the process. Um, I do think though mm -hmm. that it is important to remember that it's putting those pieces together. You know, when I do say that, I don't want to minimize all of our wondrous science. I mean, I'm a scientist. All the wondrous science that we have, all of our knowledge, it's putting those together in a blended way that really makes us truly uh, reach into our clients and make a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And your favorite topic is relationship as a healing force. Can you explain what you mean by this and how we can use this in our OT work? I feel like you've touched on it already, but what else can you add to this? Well, I wrote a book on this topic, so I guess I should be able to talk about it with a little bit of ease, but it's such a big question again. Um, and the book I'm speaking about is called Conversations with the Rattlesnake. And you can tell I'm a storyteller, which is actually um, by design because people remember information better when there is evocative emotion in the information. So I was speaking at a conference on truth and reconciliation, which here in Canada is like your indigenous restorative healing process. We're on the same journey here in Canada. And I was a, a keynote speaker talking about resilience. And in that conversation, it was televised. And I was very anxious because the camera is, was not at the time, that's already a long time ago, something that I was comfortable with at all. And at the first commercial, the producer says, the next speaker's not coming. Could you please keep talking for another three hours? And I was like, this is a trauma. So I, keep, I started talking about attachment and relationship. And one story that I told was about 
what we know about when someone puts their mind in the mind of the other, that this is what I call gleaming and beaming. And the circuit of love, of interest, of curiosity about you, lights up the oxytocin dopamine circuit in my brain. And within 20 milliseconds, your brain follows mine. And this circuit is the CEO of our brain. It's the senior executive of cognition. It's the senior executive of attention span, of working memory. It stops you from hitting your boss at a staff meeting. It's the part of you responsible for self-regulation. And so relationship drives function, cognition. That's how it emerges through co-regulation in attachment. So I was talking about what happens when this doesn't work, when children are, grow up in adversity, when there's neglect, when there's addiction in the home, when there's domestic violence. And at this conference, there was a very famous Canadian hockey player, because in Canada, hockey is like a religion. And at the end of my workshop, this famous player named Theron Fleury walks up to me and says, you, you just changed my life and you're gonna work with me probably for the rest of yours. And I was like, okay. And then he said, let's write a book. Because he had been sexually abused as a young man in junior hockey and became a very significant addict and lost his entire hockey career from his challenges in addiction. And in that lecture, what he discovered was that his challenge came long before the sexual abuse in what we call early developmental trauma. And so our entire experience of conversations with the rattlesnake is about healing through relationship. When someone sees you for more than your behavior. That was a long answer to your awesome question. I love that. And how can OTs, how can we have these therapeutic relationships with our clients? What can we be doing? Well, it begins with intention. I mean, most of us can relate in a week. There's the clients that we look forward to coming and we have the sweet spot with them and we're excited when they arrive. And then we have the ones that we're like, oh, I hope they're sick this week. And they never are because we don't know what to do or, we, they, or they activate aspects of ourselves. And so when we create an intention, which is kind of like making a wish, we've already primed our brain to be ready for connection. We've already lit up the circuit. And I know that most of us in our training, we learn, we make lists, we make goals, we make objectives, we do therapeutic plans, but we don't know how to be present. And all the information of, and I shouldn't say it that definitively, some of us do, uh, we show up in our cognition and that takes us out of our connection. So when we intend, it, it sort of unfolds. So it's kind of like, I'm going to take a risk today and not bring in my list. Or I'm going to come into this session and I'm not going to have a plan. And I'm going to see what happens. And that's where the relationship becomes in the foreground. I love that. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, and I think that's when our clients can really flourish when we are being present with them and we can follow their lead as well. Okay, let's talk about trauma. Um, how would you describe trauma? What, what does trauma mean to you? Well, right now we're in the middle of a collective trauma. This pandemic experience has given each and every individual on our globe an experience of this word. And this is the first time at least 
in recent history that our globe has felt this in every, every corner. This morning I was speaking about developmental trauma. I'm going to bring up that word for a minute, which is a stress response that takes you outside of your window of tolerance, which is like a bucket of what you can tolerate and moves you into fear, into your fear circuit. We are afraid for your safety, afraid for your needs not being met, sometimes afraid for your life. And so this particular collective trauma, many of us have those same fears. So trauma is in the eye of the perceiver. What is traumatic to one is different for someone else. And anytime your bucket is so full of stress and you can't contain it anymore, you move into the zone of trauma. It's actually a part of the human experience. It's not an event specifically, although events can be called shock trauma, car accidents, earthquakes, forest fires. I think of Australia. But developmental trauma, which is a form of trauma, are traumatic experiences that you, it, that you have in the context of relationship. And they formulate your identity of who you are. And it's kind of like if I grow up in a space of love and comfort and security some of the time, it's like a clean piece of paper that gives me resilience. But when I grow up in traumatic, dysregulated spaces, that piece of paper becomes fragmented. And then any future events or challenges or struggles land on those fragments and it decreases my capacity to meet events in a way that I can draw from my resilience. And this is what's happening to so many in this pandemic. We're seeing the best and the worst of humanity right now. Mm. So that's my feel of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like from what you say, we all perceive trauma as differently. It's, it depends on how we internalize the external things that are going on around us. And it, it doesn't have to be a major event. It doesn't have to be a pandemic. It doesn't have to be a horrific death in the family or something like that. It can be something that maybe we view as seemingly insignificant, but the person who is experiencing the trauma sees it very differently. You know, to a neurodiverse brain, the fluffies in your socks is a trauma. The sound of people chewing is a trauma because the amygdala is the brain part responsible for this challenge or for this ignite, you know, your amygdala will be ignited when the stress response is too high. So it really does depend on the perception of the brain in which mm. you live. Mm, incredible. Okay. So can you tell me about a time where you were challenged as an occupational therapist when working with a client who had experienced trauma and how you overcame that challenge? Well, I tell this story all the time. And so some of your listeners might have heard this story. So I say that humbly, but this is truly one of the most challenging times. I have many, but this one was unforgettable and transformative. So, and this was not really in the role of clinician. Uh, in the late 90s, I lived in the Arctic of Canada, where I developed the mental health system for the Inuit people of Canada. And in our community, the Inuit people uh, who have lived on the tundra in igloos on the land and, you know, hunted as their primary life for thousands of years, I have a statistic now in Canada in the last 50 years as the highest rate of suicide and sexual abuse in the world. 
And so in the 90s, I had this job to create the mental health system for the territory of the Inuit. Talk about an, a vertical wall of learning. So in our community, we had this kid who had nine different diagnoses and oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, attention deficit disorder, every D you can think of, and was ter terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Many people would fear that this was a psychopath in the making. And I was a bureaucrat. I wasn't a therapist at the time, but I had this kid's file on my desk. And one of his early traumas was witnessing his grandmother be eaten by a polar bear. And he stopped talking at that time. So he had been an elective mute for, I met him when he was 17, all that time. And he was menacing. He would pick the wings off living birds. He was a creator of chaos. So one day I'm sitting in my office uh, at my computer working. And my office was in a school because there isn't any office space in the Arctic. And he sits himself down in the chair across from my desk, pulls his hood over his head, crosses his arms and crosses his legs and just sits there. And I'm not really sure what to do. And he gets up and leaves and starts showing up every day. And the whole community is very happy he's sitting in my office because he's not creating chaos everywhere else. But I go home at night and I say to my husband, this is my biggest failure as a therapist because I don't do anything for this kid. I don't do any psychotherapy. We don't have any functional activity going on. There's nothing happening here. And Bob would say to me, Kim, you make that kid talk and you will fail. He feels safe in your office. And that is something. And so the challenge for me was letting that be enough. Well, this went on for two years that he started showing up at 8.45 in the morning and sitting there until 3.45 in the afternoon. Well, I had a one-way conversation with myself. And at the end of our time in that community, I worried about him because he was such a high risk youth, homeless in the Arctic, if you can imagine. So five years after leaving there, I saw him in the South of Canada at the Inuit center where they have their health. And I was very out of my mind with excitement. And he's such a cool, aloof, disconnected human. And he looks me in the eye and he says, I heard his voice for the first time. He says, you, Blondie, want you to know something. You stopped me from killing myself every day for two years. And you carry, I, and I carry you with me in my head every day. So it was, the issue for me was being enough. And I would say that is my chronic issue, being good enough. And that has its fingers in every part of my life, not just part of being an OT. But I think many of us suffer from that. Do I do it? Absolutely. I've got tears in my eyes just listening to that story. Um, and I feel like so many other OTs will be able to resonate with that message of not being enough or not doing enough. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think that is such a powerful story and a powerful message for us to take home and to remember we can hold that space and it comes back to holding space, doesn't it? It sure does. Mm -hmm. So why would someone who has experienced trauma, why would they see an OT versus another type of therapist? Most of the time you'll have no idea. Do you know the statistic of trauma is previously one in two. One in two. And that's childhood developmental trauma. So everybody has trauma. So no matter who shows up, 
And if you need an OT, probably you're having some trauma related to being different or needing support in some way. So I think one of the worries that all therapists have, whether you're a psychotherapist or an occupational therapist or a counselor or a teacher or whatever, is there's this belief that I need to know the story of your trauma in order to know what to do for you. And that's false. Because our history shows up in this moment. Whoever's in front of you is bringing their history with them right now. It shows up in their resistance, in their engagement, in their compliance, whatever behavior they bring to you in whatever way you are serving them. That's how you become trauma sensitive is to stay curious about how people show up in their, in their interactions in everyday life. Mm. And as OTs, we have something so unique to offer, don't we? You know, the therapeutic use of occupation to help shift someone's state or to help them engage in meaningful, purposeful occupations. So, I mean, that's something that is very, um, very unique to our profession. What is the current evidence for OT as a trauma intervention? Oh, that question makes, when I read that question, I was like, ah, oh. the reason I went, ah, oh, is I vulnerably, I'm always activated by that word evidence. Um, as a um, neurobiologist, all of our conversations globally are about evidence-informed practice instead of evidence-based practice. As we, you know, this whole global interaction between bodies of knowledge merge, you know, we, we need each other from epigenetics to neurobiology to physics to, I have a colleague who is studying the impact of traffic patterns on the neurobiology of the brain. So I feel like if we look at research, which I do in the bathroom, by the way, if we look at research, what is the evidence for occupational therapy in the treatment of trauma? You're going to be very limited in your outcome of that search. So if you go to Google and you look there, but for example, if you look at the neuromaturational treatment model of trauma, which was developed by Dr. Bruce Perry, his plethora of research for the last 25 years is on the impact of developmental trauma on sensory processing and how interventions that address arousal, sensory processing, integration of movement, co-regulation, all the things that occupational therapists do. That's what he would say is the primary need of intervention. So I think the challenge for most clinicians is they don't know where to look for the evidence that you are hoping for. So behind me uh, right now, I know this is a podcast, but behind me is my bookshelf and I have thousands of books in my house. Uh, that's, an under that's not uh, exaggeration. My husband would tell you it's our biggest challenge. And none of them, almost none of them are about occupational therapy. They come from such vast reaches of different thought processes put into our, our frame of references. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you said something then that I really want you to explain the difference between evidence-based and evidence-informed. Can you explain that to us? Sure. So an evidence-based uh, research uh, study would be like a drug trial, for example. I provide an intervention and there is a measurable outcome. And that would, that the challenge of course in professions that are humanistic in nature is that 
you don't have a, you have a heterogeneous population. Um, I was speaking at the National Institute of Mental Health and the president of the National Institute of Mental Health stood up in front of 12,000 people and said, here at the National Institute of Mental Health, we will no longer accept any research proposals based on the DSM-5. You researchers need to do better. You need to look at people holistically. You need to look at them neurobiologically. You need to look at them contextually. You need to look at them endocrinology. You need to look at them from their immune systems. You need to look at them like an occupational therapist. That's my words. From a holistic perspective. So evidence informed draws from multiple transdisciplinary bodies of knowledge and informs our clinical practice rather than, okay, this treatment has not been shown to consistently change a predictable outcome across time, so I'm never gonna use it. But an informed decision means I go to the literature and I look for information that helps inform my clinical reasoning. And then I do the best that I can with the information that I'm gathering and that never ends. Mm -hmm. And that, that said so well, because there isn't this one size fits all approach to therapy or to treatment. We really have to look at the individual, like you said, from all those different systems, from um, the mind, the body, the spirit, where they are at at this point in life and where they want to go and, and help them on that journey. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for explaining that. Um, what would be your top three practical strategies for working with clients and families with a trauma history? Mm, number one, show up authentically. And nobody, you know, that that's a really sounds so minimal, but we don't. We don't because of what we think we should do. But when you show up authentically, people feel safe. And they, in that safety, you've created tremendous possibility. People who have experienced trauma don't feel safe. And so if you're not fully authentic, they can smell it for miles. And that gets in the way. So that means if I don't know what to do, I say I don't know what to do. Or, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to be here with you and we're going to try and figure it out. So the other top strategy, I would say, is to continue to reflect on what activates you. Because our judgments are felt by the client 100% of the time. Uh, I am speaking incessantly at this moment on concepts of diversity, Black Lives Matter, Indigenous issues, and we all can do better. So that is the second piece, is reflection. And the third is to develop scripts. Because when you are stressed, you it's hard to find the language. So over time, it's helpful to have some phrases that you can draw from that help you say things when you don't actually know what to say. And for me, I, I, that took me about 20 years using little yellow sticky notes underneath my light switch where I had phrases. And a lot of my clients who had borderline personality disorder, they taught me these things because they were so hard. And I was always lost for what am I going to say? And they were my greatest teachers of finding the right words. Awesome. So those are best suggestions. Great. So number one, show up authentically. Number two, make sure you are reflecting. And number three, develop scripts. Excellent. Okay, let's start to wrap it up. Oh my gosh, Kim, I could talk to you all day and I had a million questions that I wanted to ask you and I know everyone else will be going, oh, but you didn't ask this, but you didn't ask this. We have to wrap it up. 
Um, let's head to the three rapid fire questions now. So number one, in one sentence, how do you describe OT? Occupational therapy is the profession that helps you be your best self. Love it. Short, simple, and nailed it. <laughs> Number two, what's one healthy lifestyle habit listeners can implement today? Reflect and watch what happens in your own mind. Number three, if you could only offer one piece of advice to OTs, what would it be? Find your passion, get lit up. And if this profession is not for you, it's okay. Mm. And this is what the OT lifestyle movement is all about. It's about helping OTs to pursue their passion, to find out what it is that they are really lit up by. Because we've got to look at our own lifestyle as well, as well as our clients. Um, so we need to be doing the work that truly matters to us. And like you said in the beginning, OT is so diverse. It's incredible. There is not an area in life in terms of the people that we can work with, the environments, the populations where an OT wouldn't have something valuable to offer. So we need to take the roof off our expectations and really do the work that matters to us because we can work in any landscape. So... Thank you so much, Kim. You, I am just in awe of your depth of knowledge. You have just an incredible ability to explain um, what, what you want to say. I think um, you're so articulate and you're an absolute trailblazer. You are so incredible and I'm so grateful that you are doing the work that you're doing because you're, um, you're paving a way for us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rhiannon, for having me in this conversation with you today. Can I ask him too, before we close out, where can people find out more about you? You said you do have the book, Conversations with a Rattlesnake. I know you're always doing lots of courses. Where do we go to find out all this? Thank you for asking that question. My Matters team will be happy that you asked that question. So our website is www.kimbarthel.ca. And you can also find me on Facebook, Kim Barthel, and LinkedIn. So please feel free to communicate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kim. I really appreciate it. That was fun.